dishonest folks whose victims always live to tell the tale. Hello to my good buddy, Adam Lawler. Hello to my bestest friend, Beck Rose. Ooh. <laughs> I, here we are. Episode three. Episode three. This is beyond my comprehension. <laughs> I know. Three episodes. <laughs> We're living the dream over here is what we're yeah, doing. It's good. All it takes for, for all you listeners out there, all it takes to get over imposter syndrome is just do three of anything and then you're good to Oh, go. you're, you have you corrected, like you've solved imposter syndrome is what you're telling me. Yeah, it's all done. Like, I don't know what everybody's complaining about. It must be real nice to be a cis white man. Oh, it's so good. I have confidence about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot relate, but you know what? I'm glad for you, bud. Thank you so much. No, I heard a rumor. You have a correction for us already. I do. Uh, the imposter you. syndrome may be yeah, uh, gone, um, but the, the mistakes are I not. Mean, it's the exception that proves the rule. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, Late our on correction us. came from a lovely listener uh, who is more fluent in French than I am. And uh, we're going to correct the pronunciation of Martin Guerre. From episode one. From episode one. It is Martin yeah. Guerre. Guerre yes. is the French word for war, which I did know, but I thought that the name, for some reason, like I thought that the name would have been derived from the word for war, so I just went with Guerre, but is Martin Guerre is our correction. Okay, I don't think I can say that as confidently as you do. Guerre? Exactly. Never mind. You I knocked it. it out of the park first try. Um, I do think that man club. <laughs> oh, it feels so good. Um, now I believe I questioned the pronunciation, but was told quite confidently. You did indeed. Yes. Uh, it, that it's, was... it's similar to the cheese is I think what we grew <laughs> <laughs> Gruyere. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Now, speaking of old Marty, um, mm -hmm. you failed to tell us. That there is a movie about it there is starring Gerard Depardieu. 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 <laughs> How could you have passed that over? Like, I France's thought, gift to the world. I thought that I had said it, but perhaps I didn't. Yeah, I, I don't know. Ooh, now, I, I, now I don't even remember. I actually haven't seen the movie. I've only read the book that the movie is based on. Oh, okay, hipster. And yeah, yeah. It was before it became a movie. I think it was a movie in like the seventies too. Oh it's yeah, yeah. He's he is pre our generation. <laughs> I think many people are googling who he is, and we just know it because we listen to a lot of last podcast on the left, and mm, they talk about yes. him all the time. That is true. That is true. But yes, and also I he's in Man in the Iron Mask. Oh, you're totally right. Yes, I forgot that he was in Man in the Iron Mask. I was doing a little bit of a Leo um, movie marathon recently. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> and that was one I'd never seen. I feel like he might actually also be in like one of the million remakes of the Three Musketeers. Oh, I think you're right. I think when okay. I was looking at the IMDb trivia, it was like, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you I'm cut like... Gerard. He bleeds. Three Musketeers. <laughs> <laughs> he just has a. He has a very historical face <laughs> is that a compliment <laughs> no i just i guess you have a face for it's history kind of, it's <laughs> you got one for the history books pal no it's it's like a uh he has a timeless face like i can picture him at any moment like some people i i remember seeing a tweet for the new uh persuasion movie with dakota johnson on netflix and they were like, Dakota Johnson is incredible, great, great actor, great artist. Uh, she does have the face of someone who has seen an iPhone, though. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, it's so true. Like, I can't look at her. I'd be like, you just put down your laptop. Like, <laughs> yeah. You, you don't have a Jane Austen era face. But I feel like Gerard Depardieu, there's a lot of people that do have those faces where they can just. That they're is just believable hilarious. In oh, my God. I'm deceased. That is so funny. <laughs> so, what story do you bring for me today? All right. Yes, it is my turn to go first. Um, 
real excited. First is worst. <laughs> That's the last podcast. Or the last podcast. I'm obsessed. Um, an always sunny joke that I will definitely cut. Uh, okay, here we go. So this tale, it's a little bit of a cheat in terms okay. of our rules. I ran it by Adam. So stop yelling at me, everybody. Uh, so this is an attempted murder story. So you can all know for sure, as always in our tales, no one is being murdered. But there is an intent of murder. So I heard this story on another podcast that I love called Let's Go to Court. And as like I'm waiting through the story to be like, please tell me no one dies because like this is insanity. And I really want to tell Adam this story. <laughs> So, here we go. So, I want to I want to ask you first of all, Adam, what comes to your mind when we discuss stage moms? Ooh. Um probably the first thing that that jumps in there is the and I know it's not even like a stage mom, but it was the mom of the cheerleader in the states that like Shut pop. up! Is this a story? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I'm so excited! I'm so excited because I Fuck I knew. Off. No, no, I I knew about this. I just know like headlines because okay. when it first came out, I was like <laughs> not in. I was at a moment where I was like, I recognizably can't go down a rabbit hole. I cannot. Right now. I cannot believe that you just said that. I thought you would have been like. Dance moms, pageant moms. Instead, so, you're like, let me pick the story you're about to tell us. I'm <laughs> uh, sorry. I'm so sorry. No, that's incredible. That's incredible. So no, this uh, is gonna be great. I cannot wait to hear because I. Oh my god. I, it's a pretty wild story. Be... Okay, okay. So <laughs> Adam thinks of this story. I personally, when I think of stage moms, think of the beloved classic dance moms. Gotcha. Abby Lee Dance Studio. And truly, I could see this story happening on like a dance mom's. Like when you see how wild these parents are about like fulfilling their own dreams through their children, they will stop at nothing. Right, right. It was one of the shows that I I just... Oh no, why would you to... watch it? Yeah, well, Adam, there's no reason for you to watch that show. Oh, okay, that's good. It is was not there, made like, for you. Was there like... What was the entertainment from it? Like, what what did, what was the feeling that you were like, I'm going to experience X when I watch this show? Uh, I will, like, I would say it's kind of akin to, like, any of those kind of, like, Bravo shows. Like, there's cringe value. There's, like, extreme. Um, but it also had the added thing of, like, talented dance. But Abby Lee would pick the most ridiculous themes. And I remember there was, like, an Anne Frank one there was like an Amber Alert one where like <laughs> it was she just picked the most inappropriate themes for children to do dance recitals to. That is bonkers, but yeah, all it's, right. Yeah. So there were multitudes of levels of the entertainment factor. Um, there's a really great shot of uh, this is the quickest aside where they're like in a dance studio and Abby Lee is on one of those like motorized scooter things and she's on her phone and someone leans forward and says, can you please get off your phone while the dance recital's going on? And Abby Lee looks around her and then just backs up her little <laughs> scooter what? and then she like goes down the street and you see the cameraman running behind her and being like, where is she? Where is she? And she go takes her motorized scooter down the road to a police station and goes, I had to file uh, an assault <laughs> what it's about children dance so the stage bomb we're focusing on today is wanda holloway okay wanda is from a small town just outside of houston texas what i always need to say when houston comes up hometown of beyonce um so yeah that classic small town thing where like some people who live there, they're just lifers. They just, like, rinse and repeat the life their parents had. And it just leads to this place of, like, everyone knowing everyone and being up in each other's asses. 
and business. Right. right. Uh, when Wanda was in high school, she dreamed of being a cheerleader, which is obviously huge in Texas. Um, but her, you look totally shocked. Did you not know if cheerleading was big in Texas? Uh, I guess I kind of do, but like I associate Texas more with like the toxic machismo, like football, other sports. Well, guess what goes hand in hand with football? Cheerleading. That's true. So guess what goes hand in hand with, uh, I, yeah, all of it. (laughs) Yeah. Just all of it. Machismo. Um, so, but yeah, so it's big in Texas. Wanda really wants to do it. But her dad is like super religious, not into it. He calls their outfits whorish. Whoa. Okay. Thanks, dad. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, papa. Um, uh, and then, so it's in high school that she meets her first husband, Tony. Okay. Uh, when people describe Wanda, a lot of people like the first thing they talk about is her appearance and just like how well dressed she always was. Okay. If not like a little too overdressed, like especially for the type of town that they had lived in. Gotcha. And is this like a Wanda thing or is it like a thing? Is it like a, a family thing or is it for her individually? Kind of thing? It it seems to be mostly a Wanda thing. Okay. Um, okay. Like she wants the best in life. She wants um, to look as fancy as possible feel as fancy as possible um going for the finer things but not even necessarily like because it feels good but maybe to look down on others gotcha yeah gotta make the outside look pretty so you don't have to look on the inside Mm -hmm. is the feeling Mm -hmm. i get um so in describing her at the time, Tony, her, her her first husband, had said that she was very hyper, very active. She always wanted everybody to like her. Okay. Referred to as, from many as an overachiever, she excelled at piano and business classes, but the rinse and repeat of the small town set in. She marries Tony at 18. She stops her pursuits in business classes, and they start a family right away. Hmm. And unfortunately, through becoming a mother, that's where Wanda kind of found her self-worth and identity again, was, I'm a mom. So it was very much, uh, so Wanda was the kind of person who, like, poured herself into a singular kind of, kind of category. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think, yeah, it was really important, obviously, appearances, but I think then, yeah, sometimes it's like, I need to, like, be the best mother and my child is going to, like, live the things I didn't get to do. The stage mom thing. Right, right. Uh, and it's like, like, yeah. Yeah, then the, the pressure just building because then to be the perfect mother, your child has to be the perfect child. <laughs> exactly, was... which doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. So in 1973, their first child is born. His name is Shane. He's okay. named after the 1953 Western okay and apparently she was such a fan of this film when her daughter was born in 1977 she named her shana all right shane and shana unfortunately the marriage doesn't last and the two divorce in 1980 Hmm. it was said that it wasn't a bitter divorce it was still like a little tense um but they had a good relationship wanda mary Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. It was the tenseness more from outside of the relationship then? Like the small town kind of like, oh, I think it was the, just like the divorcees kind of thing. Like, No, I, I don't think it was that. I think it was more so just like, it's never really fun to end a relationship. I think right, it was just right. like, it wasn't great, but, but all, all in all, it was pretty amicable. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's trying to really like bury no, the other they, person at all. It was just... It's yeah, that it's over. But you were. Still it a part seems of my like life. they were both committed to co-parenting as well. But, okay. Okay. but, and we'll get kind of into it a bit. But they each kind of like the dad seemed to like latch onto the son, and the mom seemed to like latch onto the daughter. Okay. So that doesn't seem like the healthiest thing. But they did. It seems like Tony and Wanda like they wanted the best for their kids, and they'd work together for that. Right. For the okay. most part, which gotcha. is which is good. Yeah. Uh, so Wanda gets married again to an older, wealthy man. That's how he's described. Uh, 
that's like basically all the article says about him, really. So apparently he was not very memorable of a spouse. The two divorce, after which Wanda and Tony decide to give it another go. Um, the th- things don't work out. They don't get remarried. Um, they seem to remember why they were not together anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then after that, Wanda gets married for a third time to another wealthy older man whose name is C.D. Holloway. Okay. Compact is, Disc is Holloway. Wanda at this point? Ooh, probably. You know, I don't know for sure. I'm trying to see if I wrote what year she was born. I didn't. I'm going to say 20s, 30s. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because, yeah, you, you did. Show maybe the maybe even Her 40s. Her marriage is 18. Yeah, that's why I'm thinking, like, they started young, but this is... She would have had to, like, have the multiple. So, yeah, I would say, like, she's an adult by this point. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, my understanding is that the other two husbands made, like, a pretty decent salary. But C.D. Holloway made, like, money. Like, filthy money. He okay. was in oil, so it was, like, huge. Ah, he is the owner of the Dimsdale Dimodome. I have no idea what that is, but I love... It's I a, loved it. It's a fairly odd parents reference from Blade Oh, <laughs> He has like a massive 10 gallon cowboy hat. Oh, of course. Like big mustache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always think of, I'm an oil man <laughs> from There Will Be Blood. <laughs> but then it also then makes me think right away of Bill Hader doing that bit and going, where's my son? Where's my boy? <laughs> I have not seen the Bill Hader. I gotta oh, say, that's... it's so funny. Oh my God. Bill Hader perfect as always. So the two of them had met uh, in the choir at the Baptist church that they both attended. Okay. And the two decided, once they got married, that they would stay in Wanda's house that she'd won in her divorce with Tony. Gotcha. Um, apparently, CD had an airplane. Okay. Pretty nice. Uh, Wanda was often boasting about spending money and buying flashy things. Uh, again, it it seems like she was fancier than the surroundings of the town. That's the thing. Like, she does stand out, and she likes to brag she about likes, it. She likes standing out, though. Exactly. And um, do, you, do you think, like, in your research and your reading into her, do you think that might be part of the reason why she stayed in that small town? Is, like, because, like, almost like the fear of, oh, if you move to... Mm-hmm. Even like I'm a Texas, big fish like, in a small pond here. Exactly. Like it's guaranteed here that yeah. I stick out versus yeah. I could move to a big city and just be one of three million. That's a good point. I wouldn't. I'm. I would think for someone like Wanda, that wouldn't be a conscious decision. Um, probably more of like there's fear that she doesn't want to address about trying the big city. But I do think right. there's definitely something to what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Um. And it sounded like the town she was on was, like, kind of known as being, like, a shit town. Like, it it kind of seemed to have that, like, Pawnee, Eagletonian vibe. Gotcha. Yeah. And where Wanda lived was, like, a hard Pawnee. Mm-hmm. She's, like, um, Leslie's friend who goes to Eagleton and gets her nose fixed. And <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're in Pawnee, but Wanda's walking around like she's a goddamn Eagletonian. Mm-hmm. Uh, according to one friend, they asked Wanda once if all the money made her happy. And apparently Wanda just smiled and responded, we're having fun. I mean, be nice. hats off. That's a good, that, <laughs> that's a good response. You're going to leave I mean, them talking about that response. Oh, hell yeah. All of this is to just say appearances appearances are clearly very important to Wanda. She's been denied what she wanted when she was younger, but she was not going to live that way anymore. She couldn't get back what she was denied then, but she could make up for it now. And how was Wanda going to do that? Well, how every healthy person deals with childhood trauma, they project it onto their children. The perfect solution. It's it's so easy and healthy. So as soon as Shayna was born, Wanda was like, you will cheer. <laughs> <laughs> you will lead the cheers and you will like it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
so like I said before, cheerleading is big in Texas, big surprise to Adam. And Shayna was sent to this cheerleading focused program when she was old enough. It was through a place called Alpha Gyms where kids could learn cheerleading from certified teachers, uh, but they'd also perfect other useful skills like gymnastics and tumbling. Okay. Okay. Because it's just like so, I could not, oh my God, I could never get thrown into the air like that. (sighs) Oh God, no, no, thank you. I can barely like walk between a table and a chair that's like close together with ease. (laughs) Uh, One quote from a rather intense sounding teacher said, a lot of these girls think that they'll be a cheerleader in a month. They can't understand why they're not going to make it. So very intense, Jim. I mean, maybe if you were a better teacher. No, they have to be better students and better gymnasts. <laughs> We're here to cheer. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was said that the viewing area where the parents sat was often a lot more intense than it was on the floor where the kids were working, which is exactly like Dance Moms. Okay, okay. And like, just like hard parallels with toxic dads at like peewee baseball hockey game yeah like, kind of like, oh yeah that's an that's an exact compa- yes comparison right? is this is the viewing area is that blocked off in some way like is it a separate like room with a usually window? yeah exactly so usually okay. like what i've seen it i mean it's kind of like arenas too right like right. which <laughs> the canadian in me let me compare it to hockey arenas mm-hmm. um so like they could s- maybe sit above and there's like plexiglass so they can see and, and maybe they can hear a little bit because like the coach is yelling um but maybe right. like but the kids can't hear them if they looked up they could probably see them but right right yeah okay. uh so another mother in one of these rooms was verna heath verna was a different type of intense with her daughter verna's mother had been a well-known twirling teacher to twirl i don't know if that means stand in one spot and just spin (laughs) absolutely actually you get someone to wind a scarf really tightly around your waist and And then pull pull the top (laughs) (laughs) and then you just cartoon spin it out yeah it's a real tasmanian devil feel oh good lord so um yeah so her mom had been like the teacher of twirling and verna had competed and was like a champion But growing up, Verna's mom had pushed her to follow in her twirling footsteps. And Verna had decided she wasn't going to do that to her daughter. So the two have different motivations for, like, pushing their kids. Mm -hmm. um, But they do have a lot in common. Uh, So you know how I was saying that uh, everyone described Wanda with, like, some shade. Like, she's intense in her pursuits. Mm-hmm. Verna was described by Tony, Wanda's first husband, as uh, the same caliber of woman. Okay. So they're both described as intense women who will do what they want to get what they want. Gotcha. Okay. So, like, obviously their kids go to this studio because that's where they met. So Wanda's, Wanda's daughter is Shayna, who we've met already, mm-hmm. and Verna's daughter is named Amber. So they weren't that close. They floated kind of in the same circles at this like private Christian school that they went to. Uh, Both were honor students. uh, Both were on student council. Obviously, they both did cheerleading. Um, There's a sad quote, though, by one of Shayna's friends who remembered Shayna saying that she wished her and Amber could be closer since they had so much in common. But it seemed like her mom, Wanda, monopolized a lot of her time. Oh, woof. That's so sad. Yeah, so, like, so between sad. the gym and, like, she had Shayna doing modeling at the mall, which included mother-daughter outfits. Wow. The Buster okay. Bluth of it all. hmm So, seventh grade rolls around. So, all this is happening before seventh grade. This is a, this is a nightmare. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's the first year of cheerleader tryouts um in seventh grade so there's this weird thing where like apparently you have to be in a public school to try out okay so 
Wanda had prepared for this. She had had Shayna pulled from her private school and put into the public school um, in preparation, like, for the tryouts. So then right before the tryouts, Amber, who's, like, still at that Christian school, announces she's going to be trying out for the same squad at the same school, even though she doesn't go there yet. Verna's mom had worked it out with the principal that she could try out because she was, like, planning on attending the school. So they were like, okay, you can try out before you're officially here. Hmm. Uh, so, okay, I just have to, this next part's going to be so foreign to both of us. So just, I really got to emphasize how weirdly important cheerleading in, is in this community. Okay, okay. There is a three-day campaigning period for all interested parties where they have to be voted onto the team. So it's not just about merit. You also have to do a campaign. A camp? Who's who's voting? Is it the like the squad? I yeah, I guess. Or like oh maybe it's like I don't fully understand all the ins and outs, but like you need people to vote for you for you to get on to maybe to try out or to get on the team or something. But like you have to do this campaigning period. Right. It's li- like yeah. It's the. It's, it's the, the expectation. Oh my god! Yeah, so, and it's like already the 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 higher expectations put on girls, like that you like not only like you could be the best mm-hmm. at cheer at at gymnastics at the at tumbles all of these things, at the twirls at the twirls at pulling the scarf, but it does not matter if you are not inherently popular. not even like inherently likable, but like inherently fit into the model of Mm -hmm. likable that they've already decided you should be that your mother is telling you you have to be oh okay and they're like like how old are you in seventh grade 11 12 no yeah i guess maybe like 11 12 that's about right woof oof so um during this three-day campaigning period amber's pulled at a class from her private school brought to the public school so she can quote lobby and meet her new classmates <sighs> incredible to lobby mm-hmm. the article said that verna had made a bunch of flyers so i don't really know how involved the kids were <laughs> or like if they were at all uh, the, or if, like, the article is using hyperbole to kind of, like, make a point of the level of involvement. But it's saying, like, Verna made the flyers. And this little stunt, it did not go really well with Wanda. She was fuming. She spoke to the school board about the situation, called up other parents to have them urge their children not to vote for the, quote, outsider. She starts calling this child an outsider. Even though... Her kid just started at this school. But I think what it was is that, like, she had gone at the proper time of year. Like, it had been prepared. Like, okay, you'll start this school at this year. Like, so that way you're ready. Okay. Whereas Amber, it was like, oh, you're you're not at the school yet. You're going to try out and then come to the school. Right, right. So in Wanda's mind, this is like, okay, I can. Yeah. I, I can't. (laughs) <laughs> you you can understand Wanda's understand, perspective yeah I understand like exactly you have you got where you are because you played by all these rules yes that other people put in place and how dare this other person come in and not have to play by the rules and get whatever they want exactly okay, okay. so obviously you call a child an outsider and you threaten to get a lawyer yeah definitely. which is exactly what Wanda did it's the thing that scares children the most oh my god so um this this part is genuinely a little rough so there were like there were two slots available and there were only two competitors but then when amber joined there were three. Oh my god and Shayna didn't make it on the team oh boy a school administrator said wanda went through a lot when amber made the team oh okay Okay. Yeah. Little side note, um, this little kerfuffle, though, did make the school change their rules, saying that a student has to be attending the school for at least one semester before they could try out. That's interesting that that wasn't, it, like, so was it like well, probably an they didn't spoken rule kind of thing? 
I'm guessing it just didn't come up before, like this right. problem or okay. when, or like t- parents saying, I'm going to get a lawyer. Right, right. So, oh, okay. you, I forgot about the, yeah, when you're... Like she's threatening... Yeah, you're threatening we, legal action. So, yeah. Like, okay, we need to, yeah, we need to put out this fire kind of thing. So, um, what's the daughter... Oh, Shayna doesn't make it that year. So the next year, we're going to try out again. Wanda is planning months in advance. She's on the phone with Shayna's dad, her ex-husband, Tony, being like, how can we win this high school cheerleading election? We got to come up with something great. And they come up with an idea that would later be referred to as the ruler incident. The idea was that they were going to give items to the children that they might not be able to afford themselves. So they hand out rulers and pencils that said, vote for Shayna Harper for cheerleader. Tony claims that he came up with the idea and the co-parents decide to split the costs. Wanda is so excited. She's calling Tony every single day until they arrive. (laughs) What's the tracking status? When do the rulers get here? (laughs) Yeah. Probably deeply reminding Tony why they weren't together anymore. Fair, fair. Also, did they like, did they do the research into this or is it this a case of like, upper middle class to now like upper upper class for wanda just assuming that the kids in public school couldn't afford rulers i that's a good question i'm assuming i don't know to be to be honest like i think about the fact that like public schools are fundamentally under under um What's the word? Like, oh, under underfunded. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, that totally so, makes sense. So they like, don't it's a have guess. Like it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if it came from a like a snotty place or not. Mm-hmm. From Wanda, and the more we learn about her, probably a touch of snot was right. in the mix. But mm-hmm. but Tony claims to come up with it too. That's true. Okay. And yeah. it, and it is something that they would like use every day. Like that's the, the idea too. Like, oh, I got a ruler and I'm using the ruler and it's telling me to vote for Shayna and now I want to vote for Shayna. Cuz my yes. little little 13-year-old brain is so malleable to fucking advertising. Yes. Uh so after the the campaign starts, Tony gets a call from Wanda wailing saying, "They're not going to let me do this." The handouts apparently did not comply with the school election code, a Uh rule that Tony argues Wanda should have been aware of, which just seems shady, Tony. That's Uh, not. Like he said that in the article and it's like, you're just not not Tony. 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 This was your idea. Yeah. Maybe you should have known about the rule. Mate, Tony. mm. You want to accept, you want to get all the praise for the great idea that was actually against the rules to begin with. And Wanda and should have also, known that. Yeah, you want to shit on Wanda. For Wanda should have warned him. Yeah, that's... So that's really all the items are confiscated. They're confiscated? Yeah. Yeah. This goes against the rules, so we're taking them away. Oh, man. Okay. Something like being told no was not going to stop Wanda, though. She okay. kept on handing the items out. <laughs> I don't know how she didn't think she wouldn't be caught. And a meeting was called, an emergency meeting was called of all the parents of the cheerleading candidates, which of course included Verna. And from this meeting, it was decided that poor Shayna was to be disqualified. Does Shayna even like cheerleading? Like, we don't even know. She doesn't like cheerleading. She's deathly afraid of rulers. <laughs> <laughs> Wanda was described as being mortified by this. She begged the vice principal to change their mind. She had Tony call the vice principal and beg. None of it worked. The decision was final. And so Wanda made a decision of her own. She's going rogue. She's going, yeah, she's definitely going rogue. The next year for tryouts, Wanda knows she has to go big. The tryouts aren't until March 1991, but classic Wanda, she starts planning months in advance. She had started a clerical job uh, in the school with the, with the band director's office. 
And she had asked around about what she could do to help Shayna's chances to get on the team. Is there someone we can cozy up to? Is there any way that we can get Amber or any other competitor or Amber disqualified? (laughs) Finally, Wanda heads to a familiar trailer. Wait. Yes, that's what I wanted to say. (laughs) I capitalized trailer for some reason and really confused myself. For some reason, Wanda decides to get in touch with her ex-brother-in-law, Tony's brother. Okay. His name is Terry Harper. He was probably the closest person that she knew who had, like, any level of criminal element. He had really minor, like, it was a really minor criminal element. He had been charged with some misdemeanors, including a DWI, which is in part, which in this part of town was, like, it sounds like just being considered rough around the edges. <laughs> like he was not there. seems like there were darker places. Right. Right. At this stage of his life, when Wanda comes to him, he has completely changed his life after becoming a born again, Christian boring again, Christian more like it. <laughs> <laughs> so many reasons. So, so many reasons he was the wrong choice for Wanda to go to, but she still asked. So Wanda asked Terry, How much do you love your niece and nephew? Just coming in hot. Mm -hmm. He says he loves them with his whole life. Wanda is like, excellent. (laughs) (laughs) It is exactly what I wanted to hear you say, Terry. She says, I need two people taken care of and I don't care how. Terry is shocked. Two people. Was there like a... (laughs) Was there a lead up in the conversation or was it just like Wanda at the door? Hey, okay, how even much do you love these kids. Even worse, in the article it said she pulled up to his trailer and honked the horn. And oh he like my came God. out. Yeah. Hey Terry, what's up? So how much do you love your niece and nephew? You want to kill some people for them? In any way you like, I do not. Anyway, care. I just want him gone. Wow. Terry okay. is shocked. He says to Wanda, I don't do anything like that, and I don't know anyone who would off a 13-year-old child. Yeah. For some reason, Wanda's like, cool, okay, no problem. I'm I'll get back to you. And Terry just like (laughs) Yeah. Terry just I await your findings. (laughs) (laughs) Terry says You know when you find that guy who's like, Yeah, sure, I'll kill this prepubescent child. But even for Terry to be like, no, and Wanda to be like, okay. I'll, I'll call you in a bit. It's like, I said no. Look, she's just hearing anything yeah. she wants to hear. And like the biggest, like in a, in like in her mind, is this not now a loose end? Like you've included this person who's like, absolutely not. I like, no, she didn't. She wasn't even like, I was just joking. Like what a weirdo. It was just are. a Josh. <laughs> Take everything so seriously. Every time I come and honk at your house and ask you to murder someone. Oh, it's always like, Take a joke, Are you really Terry. asking me to do this? And I'm That's like, n- I don't know, am I? I can't go back to prison. Like, <laughs> Jesus, Terry. So he doesn't hear anything from Terry until Christmas Eve, where Shayna says to him that her mom wants to talk to him and, like, gives him a phone number to call Wanda at. Okay. She starts pushing Terry again on the plan. Oh, my God. The plan. Hey, Merry <laughs> Christmas. So how are you going to kill the, that those people again? Terry even says to Wanda, like, why don't you just let Shayna try out? And if she doesn't get it, then, like, she doesn't get it. Like, just let her do this on her own. Wanda's like, no, she'll be too devastated and she'll never try out again. Something tells me Shayna didn't have much say if she was going to try out again or not. Yeah, that's not. That has not once crossed my mind that Shayna has had any say in any of this. Like, we haven't even heard a single quote from Shayna. She can't speak, actually. No. You can't, she can only cheer. <laughs> she can only speak in <laughs> cheers and rhymes. Yeah. Her mom won't let her. Are those regular words? <laughs> no. Put it to a tune and add some claps. H-E-L-P. Please help me. <laughs> Tony, or sorry, not Tony, Terry is like so freaked out by this call and realizing that Wanda actually wants to go through with this plan. Mm -hmm. so terry hangs up the phone turns to tony his brother and is like so your ex is crazy and tony is like you need to go to the police 
Terry had a number of reasons why he went to the police, but he said to a reporter later on that one of the big reasons was that if something did end up happening to Verna or Amber, he didn't want to be considered a suspect. So just kind of saving his own ass. Mm -hmm. But his job was weirdly harder than it should have been. The police do what police do best, be disinterested in their job. Cool. They told Terry that he needed to get them proof that Wanda was serious before they could go any further with the investigation. Mm, makes sense. They did you know, provide. You guys a- need a department budget raise. <laughs> That'll solve everything. <laughs> they did provide him with some equipment. Uh, they wired Terry up and showed him how to record his phone calls. And over the next three three weeks, Terry worked his magic. He told her that he had found someone interested in doing the job. Wanda was elated. Terry recited the amounts the police had instructed him to say. Um, he said that it would be 2500 to kill Verna, plus an additional 5000 to kill 13-year-old Amber. Okay. Yeah. In Wanda's words, that was just too much money for her. So she decided, you know what? Let's just kill the mom, Verna, because uh, not only is it cost efficient, but Wanda... Uh, figured that Amber would probably be too upset from her mom's death to even try out that year. So it's a win-win. Yeah, everybody walks away with what they need. <laughs> this, I mean, it's insane. obviously so many social layers and like the pressures on women, the pressures on mothers. Yeah, and like put it put a uh, guy in this role in like you could switch that out and have if tony was this person he would be this like like conniving like like evil machinations kind of thing going on but then you could just like i cannot imagine the amount of media attention and stories on someone like wanda just be like basically being like oh she's hysterical exactly it becomes like girl on girl crime and like hysterical women and yeah there's so many layers to it that being said everything she does is like batshit but wild but yes what are you doing and like oh yeah this is yeah okay (laughs) so on the day that she's meant to bring terry the down payment for the hit which would lead to her arrest uh, she drops Shayna off at church, which, like, yeah. I wonder if that felt weird for her at all. I mean, she's not killing anybody, so. That's true. <laughs> and then she went to Terry's to go drop off a pair of diamond earrings that she was going to use for payment. Oh, okay. Handing them to Terry, she says, quote, I couldn't pull the trigger myself, but I can sure do it this way. The next day, police arrest Wanda. When police told Verna about the attempted hit on her life, she said, I felt numb and I felt hurt and I sank into the couch. You've really got to dislike someone to do that. (laughs) I mean, you're not wrong, Verna. (laughs) Yeah, it's putting it a little lightly. Now, Adam, I know you are just dying to hear how that year's tryouts ended up. I would love nothing more. I knew it. I can see you salivating. Uh, Because don't forget, this happened all before the tryouts even happened. So, like, we still have them. So, the school tried to keep the date and time out of the press because this had become national news. Okay. Opening monologues on late night TV shows, newspapers, the whole deal. Administrators were positioned outside to keep watch. Verna Heath showed up with her head held high. It was clear that this had been affecting her. She had noticeably lost weight, and she really kept to herself. She sat with some of the other parents and supported Amber. Amber was also a target of attack during this. Someone had to face her campaign poster by drawing a bullseye on it. Eek. Whoa. But with four open spots and four people competing, everyone got a spot. But Shayna did not compete. Whoa. Was, okay, so... Was that Shayna's choice? Or did they, like, bar her from competing this year? I don't know, to be honest. Okay. Probably, I would assume she was barred after everything, but either way. Hmm. Wanda was not getting 
a lot of sympathy from the public. Surprise, mm-hmm. surprise. People complained that she looked too comfortable in front of the camera. Both Wanda and Shayna were acting as if nothing was wrong, which put a lot of people, like, their backs up. Right. Wanda refused to go to counseling, and Terry sued her for custody as a result of that. Terry? Oh, sorry. Good catch. Tony. Oh, okay. Okay. I was like, I wrote Terry. Terry's really stepping up. Terry's coming in and being like, you know what? I really do love my niece and nephew. (laughs) I'll show you how much I love them. No, no. Sorry, Tony. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Uh, The two shared custody of Shane and Shayna. Uh, with their oldest Shane apparently showing clear preference to his dad. Uh, And like I said before, it sounds like Shane was kind of the dad's project and they really focused on academics and Shayna was the mom's. But during this, Tony said how his son's college money was having to be used for his mother's defense. And he says, calling it like thrown down the tubes. That is... Yeah. Uh, In... The first trial, she was convicted to solicitation of a murder and sentenced to 15 years. But there was a mistrial because it turned out that someone on the jury was on probation for a drug-related felony. Okay. That has a whole aside that I really only know because Let's Go to Court talked about it where he had been on a jury before and a judge had said it was fine. And then he... um, was on this one. It's like, so he thought it was okay. Like it wasn't um, a devious thing. Right. Right. Yes. But there, a mistrial was called because of it. So a second trial uh, goes underway. Wanda pleads no contest and she successfully negotiates a plea bargain. So on September 9th, 1996 state district court judge, George Goodwin sentenced Holloway to 10 years in prison with a fine of $10,000. On top of this, Holloway settled a civil suit filed by the Heath family. On October 2nd, 1994, Holloway agreed to pay a total of $150,000 to the victims. It was decided in court that $70,000 would be given to Verna and her husband and $30,000 to the children of Verna and $50,000 to cover the legal expenses of the case. Yep, there it is. All right. Wanda was released on March 1st, 1997, after serving just six months of her sentence. Okay. The judge ordered her her to serve the remaining nine and a half years on probation and to complete a thousand hours of community service. Hmm. And that is the story of Wanda Holloway. Whoa. ah, Yeah, that is, uh, that was a trip. I, yeah, like yeah. I said, I did not know any of those details. It's it's actually kind of, it's shocking. I mean, it shouldn't be at this point, but it's always shocking to me when a story that, a story is both somehow super culturally and socially ingrained in your mind, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it is the like predetermined nar- or like very very simplified and watered down narrative. yeah which is what the lisa nowak thing was for me like i yeah, just exactly. knew it as the headlines and uh yeah and i mean this story makes great headlines like yes yeah and it's, it's 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 so it's perfect for a very simplistic like the dual nature of reality exactly like you've got a bad crazy mom and a yeah. good like all these good innocent children and like it's yeah it, i i completely understand why the narrative became so simplified and was the way it was yeah but yeah there was so so many details about that yeah and actually in the article it said that wanda and amber like they talked about it like one time and um and then, like, never really talked about it again. Whoa. Yeah, I'm sure, like, poor Shayna. Seriously. Like, I can't imagine, like, I hope she's been to therapy because it said Wanda refused to go. Right. Which is, like, heavy boomer energy. <laughs> um, But just, like, so sad. Like, and I think what becomes confusing then is then you have to almost, like, start fresh to be like, what am I interested in? Yeah, when you've had this personality basically 
thrust like, upon you. Made and then th- and yeah, and thrust upon you. Like yeah, the you've missed out on so much exploring. Oh yeah, and interestingly, it also said that um, uh, Amber, mm-hmm. Verna's daughter, was quite into twirling. But the twirling tryouts were later than the cheerleading tryouts. Or, like, you couldn't try out for them in that year or something. And so they're saying, like, like Amber wasn't even as into cheerleading. I wonder if they knew that at the time. Because I bet if they did, it was even more infuriating. Oh, my. Shane yes. Wasn't getting on the squad when it's like, you don't even want to be here as yeah. much as Shayna kind of thing. But even then, it's like, does Shayna want to be here? It's like, Zero it's idea. as much as you want Shayna to be on this cheerleading squad. So Exactly. Yeah, well, that was such a great story. Thank and you. Again, you told it so well. Stop. <laughs> thank so you. thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, it was. It's a, it's a great one. Okay, you told me that there is no death in yours. There's no crime-related death. Okay, so there's still death. At all. I mean... Always, when it comes to you. Every story, you keep going long enough, it's going to end in death. I mean, I don't think a single person died in my story, but... Or in last week's. I mean, that's fair. Or in the week before. That's weird, because both of mine had people who died, so... yeah. I don't know, maybe get on my level or something. It's almost like I can follow the rules we came right. up with. All right, all right. <laughs> you were the one who was like, I like the challenge. I do like the challenge. I just keep, because it allows you to, to break the rule in fun and interesting ways. <laughs> oh my God, so good. All right, let's tuck into her. All right. So this week, I'm going to tell you the story about a man named Forrest Tucker. Okay. Uh, does the name ring any bells at all for you? No. I mean, obviously, I think of Forrest Gump and I think of John Tucker Must Die and Tuck Everlasting. And now I'm just doing word association. <laughs> I love it. It's perfect. But no, I don't know the word for or the word, the people, Forrest, the person. <laughs> I think I'm having a stroke. <laughs> Forrest Tucker. Forrest Tucker, yeah. Tucker? So, I hardly yeah, know her. Forrest. You got it. You got it again. Um, Did so you hear my the... joke? No, I didn't hear it. What'd you say? Tucker? I hardly know her. hey It was perfect. definitely worth the calling back the attention to it. <laughs> Keep that in. Uh, so my main source, uh, there are a few different sources, but my main source for this is an article in the New Yorker from 2003. New Yorker. By... New York uh, by a writer named David Gran. Okay. And it's called The Old Man and the Gun. Oh, okay. Uh, it is a really great article. It's, okay. It's great writing. It's very empathetic. This story is just like, I have such a soft spot for, for Forrest Tucker. It's, it's great. Okay, I'm so excited. Okay, so Forrest Tucker is born in Stewart, Florida in 1920. Okay, my God, yeah. I wonder what Florida was like in 1920. It's Florida. Uh, has plus it always been Great Florida? Depression. <laughs> it's about to hit. Yeah, so has then, it been? You know, always been like how Florida is. I yeah, I don't know. It doesn't. There's not a lot. Like it's the communities that he was in and the kind of cities that he was growing up around seem very impoverished already, and then the the Great Depression did not okay. help that in any way. Famously. Uh, Yeah. So he's born in 1920. And his father up and disappears when he is six years old. And his mother worked different jobs just to get by in uh, Miami. But she eventually sends Forrest to live with his grandmother in Stewart again. And his grandmother actually sounds pretty cool. (laughs) She's the tender of the bridge in Stewart. Uh, and what do you mean the tender of the bridge like just taking care of the bridge like oh yeah 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 so and and um so he spent a lot of time around the waterways around the rivers things like that and he got to know the area and the life really well which included he had a knack for like building 
canoes and sailboats just mm. out of scrap metal and other things that he found. Like he was really, really smart. Like just a like very quick kid. Uh, according to Forrest, he was first labeled as a criminal when he was very, very young uh, with the petty theft of a bicycle. And bad to the uh, bone. Bad to the bone. He is first actually incarcerated in 1936 when he's 15 uh, for stealing a car, which he says was just for the thrill. Oof. That uh, does not sound thrilling at all. I mean, it was the deep depression at that point. So, like, it sounds about right to me. Like, yeah. I just, it feels like an escape. I guess they don't have, like, Netflix. Yeah, there's not, it's He's like, not, either like, I watching steal this inventing car, Anna or I to think about the, the fact that everything is real bad right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you can't turn on, like, an old episode of The Office and, exactly. and have a, a chuckle. Chill. Yes. Um, so... This is actually where he starts his other criminal career, which is as an escape artist. <gasps> I'm escape so excited! Number one. So he's sitting in the jail cell after he's being incarcerated for this for the theft of this car, and he has this buzz, this rush of doing this crime, uh, and then as he's sitting there, he's in chains. He it wears off, and then he just gets really panicked <laughs> he is very very worried about what this means so escape number one the guard comes in and just removes his chains i believe he's just they're just taking off he's still in the cell mm -hmm. as soon as his chains removed he just bolted out of the cell because the guard left the cell door open mm -hmm. ran out uh, and he evaded capture for three days oh my god well he knew the area so well but eventually a deputy finds him in an orange grove and he's just eating a piece of fruit <laughs> at the time but the fact that he not only got out of the cell but then the building yeah like the you building would think and then evaded capture yeah like you would think from cell to like hallway to front door someone would stop him but geez. yeah especially like this is clearly this is a panicked escape this is an escape of opportunity yeah like this guy's not he just this kid is not pretending that he is supposed to be here. Like, he is bolting. Yeah. Um, so he's found by this deputy, and then he's sent to a reform school uh, that's in the, in the area, but a little further away. However, over the course of being in the jail the first time, he had gotten to know some of the other boys in the jail who were also sent to the reform school. While he was on the run for those three days, he went to the reform school and slipped some hacksaws in through the window Incredible. for the other boys. They hadn't used them to escape yet. So, Forrest Tucker arrives just in time for escape number two, which is the classic saw the bars and wriggle free oh my God. to escape. But he's not escaping like himself. He's getting the other ones out. He gave the hacksaws to the boys so they could get out. But when he got sent to the reform school, oh, they hadn't okay. yet gotten okay. out. Okay. So all the hacksaws were still there. So he and two other boys saw these bars. They wriggle free and they escape. But they're caught ridiculously soon, an hour later. But the mm. detail is they're found in the river, hiding with just their noses <gasps> above the water to breathe. Which wow. is like so stress inducing to me, but also this is clearly a smart kid. <laughs> He's like, this is what we're going to do. Jesus. Yeah. So then he serves on the great American classic judicial system uh, hit the chain gang in Georgia, Oof. which is obviously awful. There's all the extrajudicial beatings and tortures and punishment that that comes with. Uh, but after six months, he is freed, but then he's arrested again for stealing another car, and he's sentenced to 10 years. For stealing a car? Yeah. Uh, they're looking at this, like, previous criminal record. But yeah, but a okay, lot of the other cases, when he goes to court, he's actually not given 
much in terms of legal representation. Mm-hmm. Like, it's very clear that, like, this is the kind of case where he comes in and he's like, since he stole that bicycle when he was X years old. Yeah. Like, okay. Like, wh- you just, you clearly want to throw the book at someone and he mm-hmm. happens to be in the room. So his, um, yeah, so really it's just like, cool state. Like, you're just doing what you want to do. So he's granted parole at the age of 24. And he, this, this scrappy, like, kind of cute kid has grown up into a strikingly handsome and by all accounts, incredibly charming young man at mm-hmm. 24 uh for a while he played saxophone in Ooh. big bands around miami that's cool. and he had this dream of being like the next glenn miller kind of like orchestrator like going yeah. around with this band recognizable name um but it didn't pan out and after a very short first failed marriage uh he turned back to another plan which was the life of crime. Okay. But this one was more informed by all of these, uh, the stories that you get out of, especially in like the American consciousness, you've got Jesse James, you've got all of these gangsters. And it's coming out of this period of time when his criminal career starts proper in like the late 40s and early 1950s Mm -hmm. and this is a time when by that time most of these big names you've got pretty boy floyd al capone is in jail all of like pretty boy floyd has been killed by the police like all of these these outlaw figures these huge mythical figures have been slowly taken out yeah but they have obviously had this massive effect on the public consciousness so he doesn't want to just be a criminal he wants to be one of these guys Mm -hmm. he wants to be a legend at at what he does it sounds like he wanted that no matter what he did yes it's it and when he he didn't get it in one he's like like instead of just being like oh i'm playing in a band and i like get to create my art and shit it's like people don't know me enough and so let's go somewhere else where i have a chance of it's it's i feel like it's a very it's a very common theme of like because you you read interviews with people who knew him and who were close to him who were friends who were who were uh who were wives who were whoever and it gets to this point where all of them seem to hit a wall of like why would he be keep doing this mm-hmm. kind of thing and i think a through line of of forrest tucker's life was like he really wanted to be remembered for yeah. something which i think is extremely relatable <laughs> it's like, yeah like not not condoning the crimes or anything like that but it's it's something that he no, it's but obviously a lot of people mind. strive for that. Like they want to be remembered. They want to be known. And if you're idolizing these people, like you want to be idolized. You want someone like to look up to you. and Exactly. Like you, and I think like, I mean, obviously this is like the personal, um, like editorializing into the story. But like, I imagine that these figures and these names and these stories were a huge... Uh, a huge part of him feeling comforted and feeling excited and not just wanting that for the sake of being famous but also kind of pushing that forward like wanting to be that figure for some other little boy who feels yeah. trapped yes. in, a, in a, a situation kind of thing so he's he's a child of the depression he has this impossibly romantic image of what being an outlaw means so in all his robberies he is emulating the idols of this world he dresses well in nice suits he's in three-piece suits he's always charismatic that is my favorite when bank robbers are so dressed up yes and there's something so so, like old and and romantic about that yes yes and he never waves the gun around he always has a gun he never waves it he says you always flash it yeah. You have it in the inside of your, your coat and you flash it to make sure that they know that you have it mm-hmm. and you don't use it. I, he was quoted in the article as saying, violence to me is the first sign of an amateur. So he just Ooh. did not ever want to 
get involved in like a violent kind of thing. Which, well, like, I feel like this kind of goes back to when you were saying like how smart he clearly was being in the water. Like, it's he doesn't want to overthrow by ambush or um yeah he, like, like he doesn't, this is a kid who like clearly he wants knows to, the ins and outs like you could have attacked the cops he wants to succeed the jump on them kind of thing yes. yeah but even just the gun like yes. he could go in and be like get on the ground get on the ground but instead exactly. it's like i am keeping this calm like i am in control like that is a that is a different level of i don't know just uh, thought process yeah just like like wrapping your mind around that like this is he was the kind of robber who like multiple bank tellers said like i he was just like such a gentleman like, he was just so charming and nice like he thanked people after he left he was like mm-hmm. just trying to make a living like thank you thank you like wow like classic classic image of like hollywood and again like um with the transy book heist like the the movies and the characters mm-hmm. that are influencing this guy uh, and, yeah and like the, his behavior and his whole persona um it's just like off the charts but i'm sure real world problems come in and <laughs> yes <laughs> and get a little hard for tucker or for forrest tucker so uh he robs his first bank on september 2nd 1950 okay and he actually goes back to the same bank a few days later and robs it again Wow. Uh, this time he's caught on the side of the road because he's trying to crack the safe open with a blowtorch. <laughs> okay. Yep. So he... Taking goes... back my inconspicuous compliment just a little uh-huh. bit. Uh-huh. 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 He's uh, really kind of standing out there. <laughs> just like, just like the flame. mask and everything. <laughs> just at the side of the road. Oh my god. Uh, so he goes back to jail, but then maybe inspired by people like Dillinger, he really leans into his identity as an escape artist at this point. Uh, So around Christmas, he fakes appendicitis so well that he's rushed to the hospital and they remove his (gasps) appendix. Oh my God. At no point they were like, it's not inflamed. He's good. It's fine. (laughs) You know what? We're already in here. Yeah, you might as well. Uh, so he says that it was a small price to pay uh, for for the for the rest of the story. Um, so as he's recovering while shackled to his bed, he of course just picks the lock on the shackles and calmly walks out of the hospital. Oh my god! In his like patient gown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so he's actually um, caught still in his gown and with his hands still cuffed together like three days later (laughs) and he this time it's not an orange grove he's in a cornfield um so he different time of year yes different time of year completely different season so he again escapes he heads to california and continues on a spree of robberies this time with a partner named richard bello who he finds he's another handsome charming intelligent former convict and they successfully rob a whole bunch of banks and forrest's only seeming like point as to why he chose to be to partner with richard bello was that bello let me count the dough that was that was it. He just like he liked Richard Bello, but like he just liked being able to count the money. Yeah. It was just a thing in his mind. So he's caught in March 1953 in San Francisco. He's surrounded when he's collecting something from a safety deposit box. And the police then go to his apartment and find a lovely young woman, the mother of a child, who is there. That she isn't actually married to a songwriter named Richard Bello, who commute, commutes to the city every day. That she's actually married to a man named Forrest Tucker, who is the father of her child. Okay, wait, and I'm so confused. So he assumed Richard Bello's name. Oh. And he got married to Shirley. 
Okay, so, so sh- wait. Hi- okay, so him and Richard have separated their ways. He was never going to, like, give Richard up or anything like that. It was just that he happened to get caught when he was going to this And Richard deposit. didn't. And Richard didn't. Okay, like, so... he had told Shirley to protect her and to protect the kid, this whole fabricated story, that he's a musician in the city, he commutes every day, that's what he does. Got it. Uh, this is obviously devastating to Shirley. Yeah. Like, of course, it's a huge lie. It's made even more devastating because... By all accounts, and by Shirley's account, he's a great husband and father. Yeah, I'm sure besides his name, everything was authentic to him. But yeah. how do you get past that? You can't because now... You have had a child government... with a stranger who like, exactly. lied to you. Yeah, who is that? Like it's this massive lie. And not only that, but like years later in um, interviews, the, the son is talking about the experience of watching his mother kind of just like end up pretty broken overall yeah and but not only that is because all of their furniture and stuff and everything in the house was supposedly bought by this stolen money the government just comes in and takes everything oh my god so like they have to move back in with their with her parents it's just it's it's a rough thing so they lose literally everything they lost everything it's their whole life is upended um so he to his credit he's very upset at the fact that he has let her down and says like you just like it's what they say about me is true go like live your life do not wait for me do not hold up like i i promise i won't bother you nothing else is going to happen to you and 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 a few months later it's annulled he gets the uh he gets the the certificate in the in the in the mail but the kid is is his right the kid is his yeah that's so sad so in September 1953, Forrest becomes inmate 1047 at Alcatraz. Oh, damn. Yes. You know it means pelican. Means pelican. <laughs> 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 oh, God. We really like last podcast on the left, if that's not clear to people. Yeah. <laughs> that's what that joke was referencing. Um, so like I said, Forrest is informed a few months, uh, into 1954 that his marriage with Shirley has been annulled, uh, and he kind of comes to terms with this. He was never, for all of these flights of fancy, for all of this drama, for all of this romanticized idea, he never seems incapable of understanding the impact that he was having on people's lives. So this is, despite the fact that he still did it, it's still a very... It's it's a very murky area, and obviously you don't want to, like, idolize someone. But that's a whole other conversation about how idolizing people is always a problem. Like, You're just spiraling. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, just, it's just a whole thing. So he gathers his wits about him. He's back into the fray of things, and he starts working with two other inmates, and they start planning an escape. Of course. From Alcatraz. <laughs> oh my so god. They decide to dig through the floor using tools that they steal from workshop. These tools are hidden in holes that they've carved into their toilet bowls and then hidden with putty. Wow. To smuggle the tools out of the workshop, they hide small pieces of iron wool in the clothes and pockets of other prisoners so that the guards think when the metal detector goes off that it's broken jesus so they get all these tools out there wow yeah however this plan is thwarted when an inmate in solitary tips off the guards about maybe kind of sort of looking at the toilet bowls in some of the cells and the tools are all found the three men Forrest included, are sent to the treatment unit, otherwise known as the hole. Oh, God. So also solitary. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. Solitary confinement. He says he's, he, when he first arrives, uh, the floor is, um, 
It's either steel or iron. And it is wintertime. Oh, it's nearing Christmas. My God. And he is not given shoes uh, or clothes. So he said the only way to stay warm is just to keep walking the whole time. Holy Otherwise, cow. your feet immediately just start aching. And there's this really surreal kind of haunting passage where he hears the uh, children's choir of the warden and guards families singing Christmas carols in the courtyard. Oh, yeah, because they have like a town, right? Oh, yeah, my God. they all God. live there. So, yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting. That's so spooky. Yeah. So while he's in Alcatraz, he teaches himself law. And he starts writing mountains of appeals. And it's just like, he he knows some of the loopholes, but he also knows that if he can be annoying enough, Mm -hmm. someone's going to grant this so they don't have to read another appeal. Mm. The pester approach. Exactly. And it pays off in 1956. uh, When he's about to go to court the next day, uh, he complains of a pain in his kidneys. Using another painful method that included secretly stabbing himself in the ankle with nope. a pencil nope, nope, when the nope. guards weren't looking. So the guards would have to take off his shackles. He escapes when he's en route to the x-ray room by just jumping up, overpowering the guards around him, and running out of the hospital. <laughs> oh my god. So what was the pencil for? It was so they would remove his ankle shackles. Like, because he's self-harming no because they didn't see that he'd stabbed himself in the leg he just said oh i'm injured and actually like ankle shackles will often give quite bad injuries if they're not like properly used so he just used it waited for a moment when nobody was looking stabbed himself with the pencil and was like my ankle like really hurts right now guys like i don't know what's going on with it Mm -hmm. they checked they take it off and he runs yes Wow. So this is this is where I, I got a little confused earlier because the, the previous escape, he had gone to California. This is the one where uh, he's caught with his hands still cuffed and in the hospital gown. Oh, so the first time he was caught. The first time he got out of jail and then he went to California and teamed up with Richard Bellow. But what like about very the last time you said that he got up and he walked out of the hospital? You're saying he. Yeah, he just went to California. Oh, okay. He got up on out of there, started his whole criminal career. Okay, so this is the time he gets caught with the shackles. Yes. Okay. So he's caught with his, his hand in the cuffs in the, uh, in the cornfield. 23 years of imprisonment later, he's released and convicted of another armed robbery. Dude. This time, I know... This time, he is sent to San Quentin in California. Holy shit. He's just hitting all the famous ones. Yeah. So in 1979, he makes the escape, which he is most well known for. He and two other prisoners spent months gathering supplies and hiding them under tarps and in boxes labeled office supplies. <laughs> in in their, their cell? In the in the in the it just in the workshops oh around. that, that yeah. checks out yeah oh it's fine don't sure open it's it. just calculators <laughs> so when they're ready forrest builds a 14 foot kayak oh shit he does not use a hammer because the hammer would be too loud yep so he's using bolts and tape he had enough paint tape for one yeah so he's just taping this kayak together i'm assuming it's not scotch tape i would hope not but apparently all the accounts the the two other prisoners with him were like that boat was so good wow i do not understand one of the other cons said i wish my that was a beautiful boat i wish my eyes were as blue as that boat wow (laughs) because he has enough paint, he's got just enough paint for one side of this kayak. So he paints the kayak and he stencils on the name Rub-A-Dub-Dub. Okay. He painted sweaters bright orange with the logo of the Marin Yacht Club that was nearby. And they somehow found sailor hats. (laughs) 
So when the time is right, they push off the costume and start department paddling. at San Quentin. It's wild. They're paddling and they're sticking close to the shore. They're going really slowly. Uh, they're right by the prison. Like I said, the boat, by all accounts, was seaworthy. One of the uh, escapees said that, like, we could have paddled to Australia in that boat. It did and not they're in their, off. like, bright orange and the sailor hat and stuff. In their bright orange, their sailor hats, in their rub-a-dub-dub kayak. Um, but on this day, the water was really rough, and the waves kept coming over the side. Oh. So much so that at some point, right near the corner of the prison property, it capsizes. So the three of them are holding onto this boat and they're just kicking gently to shore away from the prison. When a guard from the prison sees them and asks like from the, uh, from the, uh, from the shore, like, Oh, Hey, do you guys need any help? And then one of them, they all just say no, like super calmly. And one of them holds up his wrist and just says, my Timex is still running. And they all get a good laugh. The guard goes back to his post and they swim their way to shore. Holy cow. Forrest is 59 years old Fuck. at this time. Wow. So the three of them go on a robbing spree in Texas and Oklahoma where they're dubbed the Over the Hill Gang. Ha! <laughs> Rude. Invest- yeah, I know, right? Ages. The investigators don't make the connection quite yet that it's the three that escaped from San Quentin because it's a different state. At this oh point. Yeah, yeah. yeah, But it's pretty, still pretty wild. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like all these people, are like these three old men just rob, they keep robbing banks and they're like, huh, three old men escaped from prison. It's it can't be connected. Not connected. It's probably <laughs> yeah. three other old men. Yeah. It's three different old men. Um, so in one year, they're suspected of 60 bank robberies in Oklahoma and Texas alone. Wow. Uh, they, one of the calling signs for Forrest is like he's really playing into looking like an old man. So he starts wearing a hearing aid, but it's not a hearing aid. It's actually him listening to the police scanners. <laughs> Oh, so he can tell if a silent alarm has been tripped and if the police are on their way. That is genius. Oh, I just, this man. Okay, so in 1983, they decide to rob a bank in Massachusetts by pretending they were a crew there for routine cash pickup, and the ruse was quickly shattered. But they made off with over four hundred thirty thousand dollars. But this Ooh. is when witnesses finally identified the leader of the gang as the man who led the escape from San Quentin mm. as Forrest Tucker. So did something eventually... happen that like tipped them or they just they finally have put it together? It was just the, the witness descriptions. Oh, got it. OK. And then they were like, wait a minute. And they showed the mug shots from mm-hmm. Jim. They're like, oh, yeah, that was the guy. Our man didn't have a hearing aid. It can't be the same. Oh, it's not him. Um, the story of how he's caught this time is wild. He is thinking he's meeting a friend, but the friend is being used by the FBI. So he's in his car in the garage. He opens the garage. The friend pulls in and he says, I just remember thinking, wow, what a great suit he has on. (laughs) And then this guy jumps out of the passenger seat. There's a bunch of FBI agents all of a sudden. They start shooting. He shot three times in this. Uh-huh. And it like leans down in the seat to block most of the shots, hits the gas and just drives. Mm-hmm. Eventually he's like, I got to get out of this car. He gets out of the car. He finds uh, a woman who's driving with her kid in the back. He like gets in and she's kind of like, the woman who's driving is like kind of confused at first, mm-hmm. but the kid apparently sees that he has a gun and just goes criminal <laughs> and she's like what so forrest is like okay i've got to lean into this and he's like i have a gun just drive so then she drives oh and drives and God. drives and then at some point like i mean he's been shot three times oh okay i didn't know he'd been hit yeah so he's he one of the bullets i believe is still lodged in him uh, for the rest of his life from this encounter mm-hmm. and then eventually he's like t- giving her directions but like she can even tell that he's like slowly fading kind of yeah. thing and eventually he just like is like here's good this is fine and then he gets out she drives away you can just or let no, me out here thanks so no, much he, he 
Sorry, I got confused with that one. He lets them out. He drops them off, and he takes the car a little bit further. But then eventually he's like, this is it. Parks the car, and then passes out on mm-hmm. the side of the road. So they obviously find him. They uh, The authorities have to break it to his third wife, Jewel, who thinks she is married to a man named Bill Callahan. Come on. Didn't yes. he learn this? I know and uh, is he dead no he's alive he's injured he's in prison she says she goes to see him she's very she's shocked she's mortified she's angry and then she says she goes to see him and he's lying on the table he's so injured he's like in and out of consciousness but then at some point he kind of comes to enough to recognize her and immediately starts crying Mm. and then she starts crying and she's like i just like in that moment i just wanted to like hold him yeah and um so then she tells him like i will stay with you if you promise to reform like do not do this Mm -hmm. so after more legal appeals as well as a quadruple bypass surgery in 1986 (sighs) in prison wow He's released in 1993. He lives with Jewel, his wife. They go dancing. He composes music for her. Mm. He even sets up a music room in their den and teaches saxophone and clarinet lessons. Bless. And for six years, they really seem very, very happy together. And then in 1999, Forrest walks into another bank and robs the place. <gasps> He's apprehended right after, they think, three more robberies. He's 78 years old. They think he did three other ones? Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. So no one believes at this point that this is for the money. It literally, he just... He just has a compulsion. Yeah. It's, it's, he's like driven at this point. Yeah. Or he's just still like searching to be known. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, and there's a he's sent back to prison, and even at his age, he's watched constantly in mm. semi isolation. Uh, he suffers multiple strokes over the years and uses a walker and then eventually a wheelchair. So, in the interview with David Grand, that Grand turned into the article, The Old Man and the Gun, uh, Forrest says this Everyone says I'm smart, but I'm not smart in the ways of life or I wouldn't have done the things I did. When I die, no one will remember me. I wish I had a real profession, something like the music business. I regret not being able to work steady and support my family. I have other regrets too, but that's as much as one man can stand. Late at night, you lie in your bunk in prison, and you think about what you lost, what you were, what you could have been, and you regret. He also states that the worst thought was knowing how much he had disappointed Jewel, his third wife. Yeah, did she leave him after? Mm-hmm. Ah. Uh... Yeah. So Forrest Tucker, outlaw and escape artist, who by his own account escaped prison 18 times successfully <sighs> wow. and 12 times unsuccessfully. Wow. <laughs> died in prison in 2004. <gasps> he was 83 years old he left an undeniable mark on the people he encountered and at least two that he did not a son and a daughter that he had with jewel Hmm. who were connected to tucker in a letter that he wrote to his son revealing his half-sister's existence wow the article which is again a super great read uh ends with this anecdote as forrest rose to go He took a piece of paper from his back pocket. I made this up for you last night, he said. On it was a list of all the escapes, neatly printed. At the bottom, there was a number 19. One more than he had actually made. Left blank. As the guard fetched his wheelchair, he waved him away. I don't need the chariot, he said. Then slowly, with his back hunched, he steadied himself against the wall, and with the guard standing behind him, inched down the corridor and as a postscript uh the article actually inspired the movie the old man and the gun 
in which he was played by Robert Redford in Robert Redford's last film role that he did before announcing his retirement. Whoa. Yeah. Okay, dumb question. Was Robert Redford also in Escape from Alcatraz? No, that was Clint Eastwood. He was in uh, Butch Cassidy and the Well, no, no, sorry. I know who he is. I just meant was he in that one. The... No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I don't I'm looking so, it up but because I, I can't not. in a while. I've never seen that movie. Um, that, oh my God, I loved every moment of that. Wasn't that like, just the image of the classic, like gentleman outlaw. Yeah. Yeah. It's something we don't have anymore. You're absolutely right. It is Clint Eastwood. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure who else is in that movie. Um, big names. Patrick McGowan. Hmm. Robert Blossom. His first name is Roberts with an S. Hmm. Jack Thibault. Yeah, lots of people that I don't know. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's been years since I've seen that movie. But yeah, I uh, I have rented The Old Man and the Gun. You uh, rented it from Blockbuster? Yeah. Do you mean you downloaded it from, from the computer? <laughs> yeah, but it's still a rental oh um, yeah you guys you guys use the rental thing i forgot yes well, i i just got it from uh from google play because i it's robert redford uh a fictionalized version of jewel who is played by sissy spacek <gasps> um i love and then who else is in it? we've got tom waits Whoa. danny glover who oh. play the two uh, other cons that escaped from San Quentin with him and were part of the Over the Hill gang. The Oh, this movie part, came I... out in 2018. Yeah, it's very recent. Except, do you know who's in it? caveat is Casey Affleck. That's what I was yes. just about to say. Exactly. But yeah. But yeah, the Old Man and the Gun is just inspired by this story. And it's just, it's just one of those stories that... Denzel Washington's son of... is in it too. Oh yes, that's right. Oh, I love yeah, all him. of the um, the articles around it. There's so many other articles being like, "Did this really happen?" The way that it said, and the, just for so much of it, they just have to be like, "Yeah, it yeah, actually happened that way." Like, they just this is like the it is. It's unfortunate in like a weird kind of twisted way that he didn't get this kind of legendary like yeah. he didn't get to bask in that legendary like figurehood mm -hmm. but his life is exactly the kind of life that is venerated in those stories you know what i mean yeah like he, he was true to it he it was like you you couldn't have planned out a life that was more likely to run parallel to the old like gentleman outlaw absolutely even the picture of him like he looks so put together like uh with robert redford like mm -hmm. he has the old man hat like he looks so yep. put together he looks like my no no <laughs> yeah. it's, um it's yeah, the same it's, director as um the green knight yeah and a ghost story and a He's ghost story directors. and yeah. uh ink them body saints which has casey affleck so does a ghost story. He really likes working with Casey oh, Affleck for a while. He must Although not. Although Green Knight did not have Casey Affleck. Good. And Green Knight is also one of my favorite movies. Dev Patel. Oh, sexy man. Yeah, I love Dev Patel. I loved that story. Thank you so much for that. You are so welcome. I love Forrest Tucker so much. He is, yeah. I it's also like the reminder. It's a cinematic story. It is, yes. It, it is, yeah. And it's funny after... Um, transy book heist like if we had done those together they would have been very yes. similar yeah yeah and it also is a good reminder i think that like i don't know like you grow and you keep trying things as you get older is that a good lesson to take away <laughs> no i think so there's a, I, I really do like the the article goes over these points but there's so much that it, it is still worth reading for mm -hmm. there's a whole portion where when he when david grant is interviewing him in jail and he gives him like a breakdown like lesson on how to rob a bank 
love that. It's just that. so, like, it's, it really is. And I'm sure ways you can't rob a bank today. Like, I'm right, sure it's right. such a, an old, like, oh man, wow. That would be so yeah, cool. Yeah, it's it, but it's all very, it's all very, like, weirdly practical advice. Like, he's like, first, you got to make sure it's a bank by a highway. You've got to have a hot car and a cold car. You drive the mm. hot car away from the bank, you dump it, and take the cold car that nobody sees. It just, all of these, like, really, like, when he's talking, you're like, when he says, like, I'm going to teach you how to rob a bank. And you're like, oh, this is going to be hilarious. Like, he's going to say all this stuff that's like, yeah, you've been in prison for a long time. It's mm-hmm. a different world now. But the the information he gives, <laughs> you just get this sense of, like, if I wanted to rob a bank, this would actually be very helpful information. <laughs> oh, my God. Could, could you ever? I, 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 I'd be too nervous. I don't know yeah. how to, like... Like I like I, I I do have an uh a soft spot for like that outlaw yeah, the... image and like the it's I mean it's it's Robin Hood it's like mm-hmm. you're taking from the rich kind of thing and I think that that image has only kind of become more solidified nowadays with like the huge corporations that are like the institutions that are banks yeah being like. Well, that is actually, like, that's more a definition of robbery, what mm-hmm. the banks are doing, than what these guys are doing. It's just very, it's just so interesting, and I... This is your speech I, when you're robbing. You know, technically what you're doing is robbery of us. <laughs> yeah, bring the CEO in here. I, I just want you to know that this is me <laughs> just getting back at, at, at you. I'm, I'm robbing the robbers. <laughs> um, actually... <laughs> Just you would be known as the boring bandit. It'd be perfect. It would be so good. <laughs> well, thank you for listening to the story of Forrest Tucker. Thank you. I, I liked both of our stories this week. They were good. Yeah, they were really good. We're just knocking it out of the park. I'm too good at this. Let Three down. Let's just continue forever. Yeah, why not? I'm into it. No stopping us now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for listening to our tales this week. Make sure to uh, find us uh, wherever you listen to your podcast. Rate, review, maybe leave a couple words about what you love so much about Adam and I. It would really, really help us out. You have no idea. Absolutely. And uh, make sure to join us next week when we return with two more crimes. <laughs> All right, bye bye bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you so much for listening to Unscrupulous Podcast. If you want to hear more from us, you can check us out on Instagram at Unscrupulous Pod. You could always send us an email with any of your case suggestions or just your admiration for us at unscrupulouspod at gmail.com. Make sure to check out our show notes where you can find information on where we got our resources today. And we will check you out next time. <laughs>